Good morning, folks. Um, well, that's not very useful. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, welcome to the uh, panel on the EPA and Agency Gone Wild or Just Doing Its Job. Um, my name is Hill Welford. I'm uh, actually an antitrust lawyer at Bingham McCutcheon here in town, and you will notice that I am not a federal judge. Uh, judge Smith had a, a non-life-threatening family emergency, but uh, assures us that everything will be fine, but is forced to stay home and has asked me to fill in at the last moment. Um, I, uh, I am uh, not an environmental lawyer by trade, so I will be as brief as possible. I am a lifetime member of the uh, Nature Conservancy and Sierra Club, so that is how I was uh, tapped on the shoulder and said, you're the uh, next best thing. Um, I'm delighted to fill in. We're going to have uh, a short statement by each panelist, about 20 minutes of panel discussion, and then a solid 30 minutes of questions from the audience and continued discussion among the panelists. So that's how it's going to run today. And I will briefly introduce our distinguished panel. Uh, just going in alphabetical order and also the order in which they will make their statements. Jeffrey Bossett Clark is a partner of Kirkland in Ellis. He is a resident in the Washington, D.C. office and is an appellate litigator with a specially deep experience in administrative law cutting across numerous statutes and agencies. Mr. Clark has been with Kirkland since 96 and with the exception of his period in management service in the United States Department of Justice has been their entire career. His extensive experience in involving climate change litigation under the Clean Air Act, NEPA, and the Energy Policy and Conservation Act of 75, and the Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007, among other statutes. From 2001 to 05, Mr. Clark was the Deputy Assistant Attorney General for Environment and Natural Resources at the division of the same name of the Justice Department. He is a graduate of the Georgetown Law Center in 1995 and was an editor on the Georgetown Law Journal. He clerked for Denny Boggs on the Sixth Circuit. David Doniger is the policy director of the NRDC's Climate Center, focusing on policies to cut global warming, pollution from power plants, motor vehicles, and other major industries. He leads NRDC's work to complete the phase out of chemicals that deplete the Earth's protective ozone layer. And he rejoined NRDC in 2001 after serving for eight years in the Clinton administration, where he was director of climate change policy at EPA, and before that, counsel to the head of the EPA's clean air program. He also worked for a year at the Council on Environmental Quality. David first began at NRDC back in 1978 and worked on clean air issues for the next 14 solid years, helping to win adoption of the landmark Montreal Protocol, which was a protocol to stop depletion of the ozone layer. He also worked on the Clean Air Act Amendments of 1990. Next, next is Roger Martelli. He's a partner in uh, EPA practice group at Sidley Austin. Recently rejoined Sidley after serving as general counsel of the EPA, concluding 10 years of litigating and handing complex environmental and natural resources matters at the Department of Justice and EPA. Uh, as EPA general counsel, Mr. Martellus served as EPA's chief legal advisor, supervising an office of 350 attorneys and staff in Washington and 10 regional offices. Mr. Martella also served as agency counsel on six Supreme Court decisions, including Massachusetts versus EPA, climate change, Defenders of Wildlife versus EPA, finding no Endangered Species Act duty to consult when approving state water programs, and U.S. v. Atlantic Research Corp., which is the court's most recent decision regarding CERCLA. He graduated from Vanderbilt Law School, where he was editor-in-chief of the Law Review, and Cornell University, where he studied environmental science. He clerked on the Tenth Circuit for Judge David Ebel. And finally, actually, I think I have lost my last... Uh, I'm sorry, here it is, thank you. This is the problem with uh, moderating at the last moment. You can't find where things are. Uh, Raina Steinzor, and I apologize if I'm getting your uh, name, I looks like I have gotten it correctly, 
is professor at Maryland School of Law, teaches an environmental survey course, as well as offerings in risk assessment, critical issues in law and science, legal methods, contracts, and an introduction to the administrative system. During the course of her uh, distinguished academic career, Professor Steinzor has written extensively on efforts to reinvent environmental regulation in the United States, the use and misuse of science in environmental policy making, and the devolution of legal and administrative authority to the states. She's a prolific author uh, who specializes in particularly provocative titles. I'll give you just a taste of some of them. Uh, her book, Mother Earth and Uncle Sam, How Pollution and Hollow Government Hurt Our Kids, was published by the University of Texas Press, Press in 2007. Her book co-authored with Professor Sidney Shapiro of Wake Forest School of Law, The People's Agents and the Battle to Protect the American Public, Special Interest Government and Threats to Health, Safety and Environment, was published by University of Chicago Press in May 2010. And my, perfect, my uh, particular favorite of these titles was simply Rescuing Science from Politics, a wonderful uh, uh, thought uh, that may never happen within our lifetime uh, by the Cambridge University Press of 2005. I wish you good luck with that, Professor Steinzor. With that, I will turn it over uh, to our panelists who will each speak for about uh, eight minutes. Well, thank you, uh, Hill. It's an honor to be here. And uh, thank you uh, for filling in on such short notice. Uh, and uh, let me get started. Uh, EPA, it seems to me, is, uh, is, is too big. Uh, it's bloated on stimulus money, uh, and uh, it seems uh, hell-bent on expansion. Just as one example of that, from fiscal year 2009 to fiscal year 2010, EPA's budget increased from uh, $7.6 billion to $10.3 billion, or 34.7%. Uh, that's an amazing increase uh, for one year. I'm sure the American people during one of the worst recessions in history would love to get a pay raise of that magnitude as opposed to having to look for work. Uh, but it seems like it's, it's something that, uh, that, that only Washington can bestow upon itself. And then I'd also like to say that I think that it's the, the agency's attitudes uh, for that reason it, and its ambitious, overly ambitious agenda uh, need to be checked uh, by judicial review, and if not by judicial review uh, uh, in the courts, then uh, by the people themselves. So first, an introductory uh, kind of red meat quote from a canonical source for this uh, audience uh, from Baron de Montesquieu's uh, Spirit of the Laws in 1748. There can be no liberty where the legislative and executive powers are united in the same person or body of magistrates or the power of judging be not separated from the legislative and executive powers. And I think as you'll see as I proceed, uh, EPA really seems to have melded uh, the, the legislative and, and executive powers into one and, and proceeds as if they are uh, sort of a super legislature. As one anecdote to get started about the, uh, the, the attitude of EPA, and this, this is I think illustrative of the attitude of many in the agency, not all, there are certainly uh, folks who don't have an attitude like this, but, but let me share this anecdote with you. One day I was sitting uh, in the offices of the, off the uh, Council of Environmental Quality. We were talking about whether to engage in a particular uh, deregulatory initiative uh, at EPA. Sure. Uh, and uh, I was a Justice Department representative. I raised the point that, without getting into detail about what this regulation involves, so I don't really you know, reveal any confidences, uh, I indicated that if we were to engage in this action, it would be more consistent with enumerated powers and with the Commerce Clause. The EPA official popped up immediately and said, that's tendentious, you know, that's, that's biased. So to, to raise the concept that the agency is constrained by the Constitution is viewed as itself a biased statement, something I thought that was quite, quite remarkable. Uh, okay, so uh, I, introductory points aside, uh, I have a thesis statement for this talk, which is that uh, EPA in the current administration uh, seems to be uh, pursuing uh, an agenda of control that's more about control really than about uh, environmental protection. Uh, about control, I think, and about restricting liberty. Uh, EPA has become, and, and uh, uh, you can argue about whether it was sort of designed to be this way, but certainly it's become, I think, a meta-agency, an agency that is regulating in the portfolios of other agencies, uh, as well as, as spanning itself across 
the lifeblood of the entire national economy. There's no agency that really possesses a similar span of authority. It's not, it's not even close, which is why the Office of Management and Budget spends most of its time in rulemaking uh, analysis looking at EPA rulemakings and not the rulemakings of other agencies. In the back and forth of questioning, I'm sure we're going to talk about, uh, and in the presentation of the other panelists, some of the, uh, the other uh, initiatives that EPA has going on, and it's really amazing, you know, hyperactive agenda. But I just want to talk about three. Uh, the first is its program of greenhouse gas regulation, uh, which to me is reminiscent of, of kind of a, uh, a Leninistic program from uh, the 1920s to seize control of the commanding heights of the economy, uh, <laughs> which, is, which is what uh, Lenin set out to do uh, in, the, uh, in the 1920s in the NEP program. Uh, it has an interlocking set of four uh, greenhouse gas rulemakings. Uh, they're artificially divided, which is something I'll probably talk about uh, in the questioning. Uh, put that aside for a second, but they're designed to control the energy sector, and if you can control the energy sector, the, which feeds all of the other sectors of the economy, you really control everything. It's, it's the ultimate choke point of the national economy. Billions, if not uh, uh, trillions, are at stake. The second is the ozone NAX program, where, uh, you know, the administration was set to do that uh, before the election, but miraculously, I think, decided not to do that because of the incredible job impacts it would have. Not to steal some of Roger's thunder, but you're going to see a great uh, chart about the impact of that rule uh, in his presentation. The, the standards are so stringent that they, they threaten, essentially, to reduce the ozone NAX requirements below background levels. In other words, below the levels of, of natural uh, ozone that's produced uh, by the environment. Uh, and it will have, I think, disproportionate restrictions on the rust belt at exactly a time when uh, that shouldn't be occurring. Um, at the same time, right, we have the administration that professes to be Keynesian, an administration that, that, that professes to want to spend money to expand the economy. But these regulations are doing exactly the opposite. The regulations are anti-Keynesian. Uh, and it shows, I think, it illustrates my thesis, that what it's r more really about here is about control and not about, uh, not about actually protecting the environment. Uh, then on environmental justice, my third one. Uh, here, the, the administration seems to be on a crusade to, uh, to, to raise the, the stringency of environmental justice overlays and existing regulations and to uh, zealously intrude, I think, on the portfolios of other agencies. Uh, but, you know, my reaction to environmental justice programs is that it's not the equivalent to racial or gender discrimination for a company to decide for economic reasons to locate a plant in a poorer neighborhood. That just is not an equation that works. Uh, and I think actually most of the people who live in those areas now would say, if there's a new plant opportunity, bring it on. So if EPA is saying something to the contrary through environmental justice, what it's really saying, uh, it seems to me, is, is it's engaging in paternalism. That, that, you know, we at the EPA know better than you know uh, at the, uh, uh, at your uh, at your local level. <coughs> um, so now let me try to tie that uh, back to the thesis. So why is it that it seems like this is all about control and not about environmental protection? Point number one: uh, EPA has really let its environmental uh, enforcement program go to pot. Uh, here's a newspaper headline: EPA enforcement-related penalties plummeted in fiscal 2009 uh, from the start of this year. Is that from the Wall Street Journal editorial page or from the New York Post? No, it's from the New York Times. Uh, and the, uh, the quotation here is, EPA during the first year of the Obama administration saw deep declines in the amount of penalties assessed against polluters and pounds of pollution slashed, uh, according to data released by the agency last month. So that's EPA's own approach, and, and there's the, the New York Times. So let that th sink in. It's really not common knowledge, is it, that, that the current EPA is focused much more on regulation than it is on enforcing the existing laws. Point number two, it seems like EPA has very little respect uh, for, for Congress. In the environmental justice area, there isn't a statute on point. It's just a Clinton administration uh, executive order, uh, EO 12898. Uh, and then in the course of the ch climate change uh, uh, initiative, uh, really what EPA did was play super hardball and almost deliver uh, an ultimatum to Congress. Pass cap and trade, or we're going to do something worse. We're going to unleash on you uh, the endangerment finding and everything that flows from it. Uh, you know, not the kind of thing you would think that an agency that's subordinate to Congress should be doing uh, to try to follow the will of the American people. Uh, and then uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the House actually knuckled under to those uh, tactics, albeit, you know, I think somewhat narrowly, but the Senate did not. In fact, 
uh, Senator Murkowski led an effort to try to, uh, to block the endangerment finding and strip EPA that authority. And even before this most recent election, uh, she came pretty close. The vote was 53-47. Uh, um, what happened in the recent elections, obviously, a lot of the members who walked Nancy Pelosi's plank to vote for cap and trade uh, paid the price for that. I think the ultimate indication of that is that uh, Governor uh, Joe Manchin from uh, West Virginia did a campaign commercial where he shot, physically shot at a copy of the cap and trade bill. Um, <laughs> and this is, this is a Democrat, keep that in mind. Um, also during that whole debate, Administrator Jackson confessed really that the act, the existing Clean Air Act is a mismatch for regulating this. That's the whole reason why they wanted to do cap and trade. Uh, I'll return to that point a, a little bit at the end. Finally, uh, uh, EPA admits, this is the, the question, no, there are they're, they're, uh, four points, so this is number three. Number three is EPA admits that its endangerment finding and the consequences that will lead to will create absurd consequences <coughs> under the statute. So let that sink in for a second because only in Washington is it a virtue that something will lead to absurd consequences and then that gives the agency more power rather than less. It really doesn't make any sense. Um, fourth, nor do the opinions of the Supreme Court really seem to make that uh, much of a difference to, to this administration. The administrator uh, of EPA uh, regularly goes around and misconstrues the Massachusetts versus EPA decision uh, from the Supreme Court. Here's uh, from a National Press uh, Club speech on March 8th. She said, most dramatically, we're seeing efforts to further delay EPA action to reduce greenhouse gases. This is happening despite the overwhelming science on the danger of climate change, despite the Supreme Court's 2007 decision that EPA must use the Clean Air Act to reduce the proven threat of greenhouse gases, despite the fact that leaving this problem for our children is an act of breathtaking negligence. Well, I've read Massachusetts versus EPA many times, and I argued Massachusetts versus EPA in the D.C. Circuit. The Supreme Court's decision does not order EPA to do anything. It remands the case, uh, and, and you know, sort of invoking a protection of the children rationale can't put words in the decision that don't exist there. It's just a flat misconstruction of the case. Uh, and so EPA had a totally viable option on remand to decide not to regulate. It's voluntarily choosing to regulate, and the administrator going to the National Press Club to say she's been ordered to regulate by the Supreme Court is just inaccurate. So uh, let me just wrap up with a couple quick points there. I think it's not, again, this, this massive initiative of regulation that we're currently seeing is not about the environment uh, and protecting it. If it were, then why is environmental enforcement plummeted? EPA's actions show a real disdain uh, uh, for Congress, uh, trying, I think, to lead it around by the nose. Uh, that EPA thinks it's okay, really, to bully Congress and try to force it through extortion of, uh, on pains of, we'll issue worse regulations if you don't issue a statute that we like. Uh, the, to me, that turns the non-delegation doctrine uh, derived from Article One on its head. I mean, who's, who's the delegate and who's the delegee here in that relationship? Uh, it doesn't matter to EPA if it's absurd if its regulations are going to lead to absurd consequences that inflict massive harm on the national economy. And finally, it doesn't matter what the, the courts say. Even the Supreme Court, it, an incremental victory can be twisted into a command that Congress uh, itself never gave. So uh, I'll wrap up there and say, I'm asked to, to just say out loud, you know, really EPA? Really? This is what you're up to? Thanks. <laughs> David Doniger. Thanks. <clears throat> Naturally, I have a different view. <laughs> so the, my, my thesis is that EPA is doing its job, and it's doing it quite deliberately. And actually, believe it or not, it's doing it quite modestly. The 1970 Clean Air Act, 40 years ago, was enacted with a specific program for a set of pollutants that were known at the time and a, a specific and explicit duty to EPA to keep abreast of science and on the basis of uh, rulemaking with full public comment, on the basis of scientific advisors' uh, advice, to deal with new pollution problems as their threat to public health and the environment became known. Now, what was the first instance of using this power? It was to take lead out of gasoline. Uh, lead was not known 
1970 to be dangerous, but EPA was given the duty to set standards to limit dangerous fuel additives. And when the science demonstrated the threat to our children's health from lead exposure, EPA didn't ban lead. EPA began a lead phase down, which actually took the better, well, more than a decade to be completed. It was that modest. Um, their decision was challenged on the basis that you haven't proven that lead is reducing the IQ of children. You have, there's, there's uncertainty left over here. You can't act without eliminating that residual uncertainty. And the D.C. Circuit, in a landmark case of the 70s, Ethel versus, uh, Ethel Corp versus EPA, uh, upheld EPA. And Congress in 1970, that was 76, Congress in 1977, amendments to the Clean Air Act said, the Ethel Court's got that right, and put the uh, actual language uh, of that part of the law, actually ex expanded it. It talked about endangering health. Congress expanded this to make it somewhat more precautionary that EPA is obligated to act when the administrator may reasonably anticipate that the pollution is endangering health or welfare. And they put that test into all the relevant parts of the Clean Air Act. So this is EPA's job, EPA's duty, to keep up with the science on hazards to our health and our well-being. Now, when, uh, let's fast forward into the, um, the last decade. And the administration, the previous administration, <coughs> took the position that CO2 was different it, it was not an air pollutant. Well, the definition of an air pollutant in the Clean Air Act is a, any chemical substance that's emitted into the air. Carbon monoxide is an air pollutant. Sulfur dioxide is an air pollutant. And not surprisingly, in Massachusetts versus EPA, the Supreme Court said, well, carbon dioxide is an air pollutant like any other air pollutant. And if it's dangerous, EPA must regulate it. Now, the, the other thing the Bush administration's EPA had done was justify the decision not to regulate greenhouse gases on a set of policy considerations other than the science of what, what their hazard was, what, whether there's a danger to health or to the environment. Economic considerations, foreign policy considerations, I don't want to kind of considerations. I'd rather do a voluntary program. And the Supreme Court ruled that all of those policy considerations were extra legal. And the only uh, legitimate basis for the decision was science. And there are three possible decisions to make. That the science demonstrated a, a health or environmental hazard, including a hazard to the climate, which is specifically mentioned in the Clean Air Act, and uh, in which case the administrator had the obligation to regulate. The opposite was that the science didn't demonstrate that, and then the administrator wouldn't have any obligation. And the third case uh, leads to the same result, which is that it was too uncertain. I can't, you can't really tell. And that also would justify not regulating. So the matter went back to the EPA. And the Bush administration ran out the clock. The Obama administration came in. And Administrator Jackson and her team looked at the science. And we can have a debate about the science. But the science on global warming is very strong. It's overwhelming. It's a 98 to 2 kind of proposition among the scientific community. And uh, they reached the conclusion that the science demonstrated a danger. I think it's, it actually demonstrates it way beyond the level of certainty that was present with lead. But you don't need that under the Clean Air Act because you're supposed to act even if there is some residual uncertainty. So what, did, what was the, the, uh, the gross overreaching control measure that uh, first one taken. It was to work out an agreement with the automobile industry and the environmental community and the states to resolve a 10-year dispute over California's vehicle regulations, uh, which achieved agreement supported by the auto industry on a national program that harmonizes the fuel economy and greenhouse gas regulations of EPA, of, of transportation and EPA and harmonizes them with California, takes the whole program national to deliver all of us the greenhouse gas and public health reduction benefits of those standards, and to boot, 
When you buy your next car, over the life of the car, it will cost you $3,000 less to operate it and to own and operate it because it won't use so much of that expensive stuff called gasoline. And that will be good for our national security as well as protecting the climate. So what's coming up now and what has got uh, Jeff and, and uh, an amazingly broad uh, and, and messy coalition of uh, litigants, uh, so exercise. That the Clean Air Act might actually require the control of these same pollutants from stationary sources, from power plants, from refineries. And it could do that under a case-by-case -case process, which is to start next year. And by the way, EPA has been very modest <coughs> in postponing the start of that program until next year. And EPA has further been very modest, and this is, I have to make a little aside about the absurd, absurdity issue. EPA has cut the scale of that program down so that it affects only large uh, industrial facilities like power plants, refineries, and other big things, uh, and only new ones uh, and, and expanded ones. It's cut out all the smaller sources which would have been carried in, and that's the result that would be absurd. And I can go through the, the definitional issue that, that led to this problem, but it basically comes down to the fact that CO2, while it's a pollutant like any other pollutant, is emitted in a much higher volume than any other pollutant. So the line that Congress drew in 1977 to divide big sources from small ones at 250 tons doesn't work for carbon dioxide. So EPA has drawn a different line, 100,000 tons, in order to respect the congressional judgment that the permit program should apply to the big stuff and not hassle the small stuff. This is the extent of their overreaching control. So that's what this litigation is all about. There is an enormous dirtball case uh, that's sweeping up all the lawyers in Washington. Maybe not all of you. Some of you have not been hired to, to work on that case, but most of them have. And there are stay uh, petitions, uh, motions pending before the D.C. Circuit. It's one thing to be able to claim gloom and doom in a two-page letter to the Hill for lobbying the Congress to, to strip EPA of the powers, but when you have to make your case in front of the D.C. Circuit and you have a, a 200 pages, you're actually at a disadvantage because you have to prove your case. And there's no proof of, of irreparable harm that's been put before the court. When these regulations take effect in January, you will all wake up, the sun will come up, the economy will hum, it will, it will continue to improve, these sources will continue to be built, they'll be cleaner, and th the world will go on. Uh, now, I think I've run out of my time. My last comment would be that EPA has gone a long way to be deferential to the Congress. It held off on implementing the Clean Air Act. Uh, we would have liked to see some of these measures taken more quickly, but they've been taken rather deliberately. They've been taken more slowly than we think the, the Clean Air Act provides. And it, it was in order to give the Congress uh, a full opportunity to decide whether to change the law. Well, the current Congress is an, unable to decide that question, and it's EPA's obligation to continue to do its job, and to do it with due respect for technology, for costs, and for all the other factors that you would hope that rational uh, decision makers would take into account. I think they're doing a good job, and, uh, and we support their continuing in that job. Thank you. Roger Martello. Well, I've decided I'm going to start on a positive note because I have a feeling I'm not going to end there. So on September 14th, the Clean Air Act turned 40. And uh, the administrator, Lisa Jackson, marked this in a big speech over near EPA, I think in the Mellon Auditorium, with a very impassioned speech where she pointed, I think, very fairly to the very proud accomplishments, the tremendous accomplishments of the Clean Air Act over 40 years. And there's a lot of good things to point to. Over 40 years, our nation has grown, our industrial base has grown um, economically. We've developed, and I, th I think personally, as someone who's gone to lots of different countries, as have most of you, we have the best environmental protection system in the world and the best environment in the world, despite all the economic and industrial growth. So there's a lot of good things to point to. 
But I think the question that I have, and the question that's the more challenging one to answer is, what are the direction we're headed, what's the direction we're headed today, and what are the next 40 years going to look like? And I do think, given the direction we're going on, we're, we're facing a very different circumstance from the past 40 years. And, and the administrator anticipated this, and she said, these industry folks, they come in and they say the sky is falling every time. And they've been proven wrong in each and every instance. And I, I kind of take issue with that, but I also think she's ignoring the fact, and EPA is ignoring the fact, that there's really three fundamental distinctions between why I think the world is different right now compared to where it was over the past 40 years. First of all, unlike the last 40 years, EPA is moving forward with an aggressive regulatory regime that's ignoring, explicitly ignoring, I'm going to show this, the impacts of this regulatory regime. Unlike the last 40 years, EPA is moving forward without paying attention to the cumulative impacts of its rulemakings holistically and looking at everything in, in uh, smokestacks and stovepipes. And unlike the last 40 years, the multinational influences that play into rulemaking or should that play into rulemaking are more relevant than they've ever been. And once again, EPA is not paying attention to this. And let's start with the first distinction here, which is how EPA is proceeding ignorant, not paying attention to the impacts of its rules to get its regulatory agenda out. I'm going to read from a couple of things EPA has said. Jeff pointed to the New York Times. I'm going to do one better than that and stick strictly to EPA's own admissions and things that it said along the way. And starting with greenhouse gases, this is its own words. As EPA has said, as Jeff pointed out, its greenhouse gas regulations will have results that are, quote, absurd. According to EPA, they could affect 6.1 million sources, introduce $78 billion in annual cost, cause at least a decade or longer of delays, slow construction nationwide for years, for years introduce burdens that are infeasible and overwhelming, and impact sources otherwise not appropriate at this point to even consider regulating. Now, this is EPA's own words, not mine. And, and, and David says, well, they've cut a lot of this out. Well, they've tried to cut a lot of it out. Whether they've cut it out has yet to be decided. We've actually, the industry groups have actually gone to EPA and to the environmental groups and said, we have a solution for you. You can go ahead and regulate greenhouse gases, but we have a solution that would avoid all these consequences on stationary sources. EPA said, we're not interested in that. NRDC opposed the idea. And so the notion that they're acting as restrained as possible flies in the face of the fact that we've more reasonable alternatives have been offered that have allowed them to control greenhouse gases and yet avoid these solutions. EPA, in promulgating its regulations on greenhouse gases, has avoided eight different laws and executive orders that require it to analyze the impacts. And let me just point out one example. Again, I want to read from EPA. As you probably know well, there's a law called the Regulatory Flexibility Act. It makes sure that before a government agency acts, it has to analyze the impacts of its actions on small businesses and certify that there's no impacts on small businesses. Here's what the EPA said about the regulations, the impacts of its <coughs> regulations. If you indulge me, I really want to read through this paragraph. Um, agencies would be unable to keep up with the flood of incoming applications, resulting in delays at the outset that would be at least a decade or longer, and that would only grow worse over time as each year the number of new permit applications would exceed permitting authority resources for that year. Because permitting is a pre-construction program, during this time, tens of thousands of sources each year would be prevented from constructing or modifying. It is reasonable to assume that many of those sources will be forced to abandon altogether plans to construction or modify. So tens of thousands of sources abandoning plans. Yet, despite that, EPA said that its actions, quote, will have not have not have a significant economic impact on a substantial number of small entities. So we have EPA directly contradicting itself there. And beyond that, not only ignoring the impacts, explicitly telling people, please, we don't want to know about the impacts. In one case, EPA said in the greenhouse gas case, EPA in one rule instructed commenters not to comment on the effects of stationary sources, saying they should direct any comments to a different rule, the tailoring rule. In the tailoring rule, EPA said, nope, you should have commented in the tailpipe rule because that's the regulatory action causing this, and therefore we can refuse to respond to your comments on the impacts of stationary sources. So not only ignoring these impacts, they're act actually asking you, directing people not to comment and saying, when the, you do comment, it's a cat and mouse game. We actually don't want to consider this, so we're just going to ignore it anyway. So that's, that's the first concern, that we're proceeding right now, like in the last 40 years, ignorant of the impacts of these rules as we're moving out. The second concern is we have all these rules coming together simultaneously, cumulatively, and EPA is, is looking in these stovepipes and not considering them as a whole. Uh, Congressman Barden, back in October, sent a 55-page chart to EPA. Again, like me, Congressman Barden used only EPA's own information, none of his own. 55-page chart showing 69 different rules going on, having an impact of hundreds of billions of dollars a year on the economy. There's kind of a trinity of rules right now that are kind of the major focus for folks. 
there's the greenhouse gases, there's ozone max, and there's a rule called the border max, which may have the most significant impact on industry directly. If we can turn to the first slide, I want to talk about ozone max briefly. So this is what the world likes, looks like today. And a lot of people would complain that this is already uh, a problem. This is what the Bush <coughs> administration did and lowered the ozone max, the max standards for ozone to 0 0.75. And so you see a significant amount of you know, parts of the country already not, already not in attainment, already not meeting these standards. Basically, the state of California, the Northeastern Corridor, um, you can link this up to the industrial parts of the US. So the world today, as it currently stands, you have most of the industrial sections of the country not meeting existing environmental standards. Now, EPA, on its own initiative, it didn't have to do this. Actually, they've never done this before. Without anybody even asking EPA, said, we want to reconsider this when we come in. We're not sure this is good enough. And so on our own initiative, without anyone telling us to do so, let's reconsider it. So they proposed to lower the standard somewhere between uh, 60 to 70 parts per billion. If we look at the next slide. So this is what 60 parts per billion looks like if you go within the proposal. So you basically are walking into a situation for this one rule alone, effectively the whole country is out of attainment. I think this tells you something very important, a takeaway, which is I think we should be picking up and moving to Montana or North Dakota because it's going to be the only place left to, to do anything if this goes into effect. And we know for a fact EPA is going to lower the standards. They may not go to 6.0. I don't think they will. I think they'll go to 6.5. We don't have a map that shows 6.5, but it's going to be somewhere obviously in between. It's not going to look good, as you can probably tell. So this is one rule alone. Now, and the impacts of this on one rule, and EPA not really assessing the impacts. But my point is, they're not assessing the impacts cumulatively. So what happens if we go to the next slide? What you see is ozone max is only a small part of a bigger puzzle. It's just one of those tiny little boxes. You probably can't even make it out of all the things going on. And we can point to similar instances in each of these boxes where EPA is only looking either not paying attention to the impacts as it's doing greenhouse gases, looking at these impacts only um, individually, kind of ignoring the real ramifications, or definitely not looking at them cumulatively. And given so much going on, given the, the impacts of these rules as a whole, we need to be reassessing. Now finally, my last point, and we can take the slides down, please. One thing that I think has fundamentally changed in the last 40 years has been the way our, the, the world has um, increasingly industrialized and the way EPA needs to consider that as it's making decisions. And there's a number, there's basically three considerations I think EPA needs to take into account that it's not doing so. First, the more it imposes ozone max, the more it ratchets up these greenhouse gas requirements and other countries are not doing so, what it's really doing is creating an incentive for, for companies to move, industrial facilities to move to other parts of the world that do not have stringent regulations. So that's one consideration. The next consideration, what happens in those countries? I mean, we've, many of you have been to China, you've been to these other places where you know that their environmental rules are not as stringent. So what, are we, what is the impact on, we're having on the environment there by moving our industrial facilities there? And is that from an environmental justice concern, is that a fair consideration? And then the third impact is how does this come back to the United States? When we're talking about climate change, which are global pollutants, pollutants that are uniformly distributed around the world, if all we're doing is creating incentive to go to other countries where you're emitting more greenhouse gases, you're truly exacerbating the problem. And as we've seen in the last 40 years, the world industrialized and pollutants like mercury, which you know, can be transported around the world, EPA right now is not paying attention. It's not kind of adjusting its regulatory analysis to take into account these multinational issues, and I think is something that has to fundamentally change as we approach the next 40 years of the Clean Air Act to make sure that we're addressing these concerns. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Sizor. Well, I asked to go last um, in the hopes that I could gather all the nuggets of what everybody spoke before and be the most provocative person. That's a big challenge here. Um, with these great fellow panelists. Um, first of all, I just want to point out that Roger um, shifted very rapidly from low-level ozone to stratospheric ozone. Actually, he went from stratospheric to low-level in um, talking about the ozone rules. Um, it's not true. I don't think that EPA, without anyone asking them, suddenly jumped up and decided to do this. They're required to review the NACs every five years, and they are guided by uh, the Clean Air, Air Act Scientific Advisory Board, which is a balanced group of scientists who make recommendations for what the health-based levels should be. Um, but 
having said just those few things, um, I'm not going to talk about climate change. Uh, I do urge all of you, if you have an opportunity to see each other over lunch and later in the day, to have a conversation if there are some of you who believe that climate change is not man-made. I don't think you'll find too many people who spend their careers in environmental protection who would um, be able to give you much evidence that supports that, as David pointed out. Of course, saying that we have caused this problem and saying, which I firmly believe, that I'm very glad I'm not going to be alive in 35 years and that I really worry about my children, um, doesn't uh, tell us how to fix it. And that's what we're grappling with now. As much as we've tabled this issue, it would seem, from a congressional perspective for the next two years, um, we're not going to be able to table it for very long because the rest of the world is going to be in our face demanding that we deal with it. But to stop with climate change, stop with ozone, stop with all the regulations for a minute and pull the camera back to look at a broader picture, I would suggest to you that the country right now is uh, teetering in a great tug of war um, which was not resolved by the last election. And from my point of view, the biggest problem is a tremendous gap in income among people and perceptions of what the government can or should do for people depending on those income levels, which, is, which are very unhealthy. There's um, really barely, um, for the lower percentage of the population, the vast majority of people, um, are not even in the middle class anymore and are feeling anxious and angry at the moment they sided with Republicans. Um, it's far from clear. I think any of us can't be clear what's <coughs> going to happen in the next election. In the area of health or safety, um, the Chamber of Commerce has declared a war on regulation. I spent yesterday fielding phone calls uh, that were where the reports were saying a tsunami is coming, a tsunami is coming. And I said, you know, it's really interesting to me because um, I don't ever see specifics in this tsunami. I do see isolated incidents of Congressman Issa saying that, you know, Lisa Jackson better get a cot and put it in the Democratic um, cloakroom at the Committee on Government Affairs because he's going to have her up there so much, so many times that her head's going to be spinning. But on a national leadership level, I don't see many specifics, just like I don't see specifics when people threaten to cut the budget. We're going to have a big budget cutting party, but uh, we're not going to say if we're going after Social Security. I think the reason for that, and one of the things that has been left out of any of, uh, of both uh, Jeff's and Roger's remarks, is that Republicans have controlled the Congress for a very large part of the last 20 years. Very conservative Republicans have been in charge. And yet we've had no amendments of the major environmental laws, very few amendments for food safety, mine safety, occupational safety, and the reason we haven't had amendments, despite all the complaining, is that no one wants to stand up and say that I don't want the Clean Water Act to be as strong as it, as it is. I don't want the Clean Air Act to protect health. I want everyone to consider costs, too. We're afraid to have that debate, and for good reason, because if the Congress is nailed, as Frank Luntz has told people numerous times, is nailed with the perception of being anti-environmental or anti-public health, um, there will be a big backlash, which won't be pleasant. So we've avoided these issues. And EPA, which has a budget, by the way, in constant dollars that is at the same effective level it was in 1985, has been going forward as best it can without the benefit of enough authority, streamline procedures, and prioritizing. If we want to have a debate about how to prioritize which problems should come first, let's have it. The proper place to do it is at Congress, not, for example, at OMB or in the bowels of rulemaking procedures that most people don't have access to. 
if you look at national headlines in the last two years um, you see a lot of examples that the entire system is is in tatters and hanging by a thread Deepwater Horizon excellent example of that capture of the regulatory agent to be agency to be sure but EPA limping along on a budget that is at the same level as it was in 1985 had never tested the 175 million tons of dispersants that were dumped in the Gulf so we wouldn't be looking at oil covered pelicans instead we would have ecosystems deep in the ocean that we can't see perhaps dying um, right and left as we sit here uh, Deepwater Horizon was brought to you by BP uh, a company that Joe Barton had the thought of apologizing to. Um, before Deepwater happened, Texaco Refinery had an explosion where um, 15 workers were killed. This was despite numerous warnings that the conditions were perilous. A few months before that, we had the big branch mined. Joe Manchin may have, with great aplomb, shot the cap and trade bill but he would be the last person to tell you he doesn't think the Mine Safety and Health Administration shouldn't be stronger and doing a better job to protect his constituents. This summer, we had code red days all over the country. It was the hottest summer on record. A code red day is when people are told to keep their children inside because it's not safe for them to walk around outside and play. Um, that's pretty startling. That begins to become environmental conditions along the lines of what is happening in China. We've had salmonella in eggs, salmonella in peanut butter. The guy that deliberately shipped peanut paste with salmonella in is now a consultant to the peanut industry. Um, we've had lead painted toys imported from China. 80% of our toys are now provided by China. We've had sudden acceleration in Toyota cars. Um, very mysterious and disturbing for one of the supposedly safest brands. All of these m mishaps, these, these tragedies, have occurred because um, the companies did not have adequate incentives to make conditions safe enough. I'm not going to stand here and tell you that regulation would have stopped all these things. I am going to contend that there is no empirical evidence, and you haven't heard any in these talks today, that suggest that companies move offshore because of the regulatory environment as opposed to the cost of en energy and wages. Those are much deeper causes and much more uh, important factors than environmental regulation. And all of these things cost a tremendous amount of money. I mean, ask BP about deep water, even the peanut incident where, in which nine people were killed cost the peanut industry alone $1 billion. So there is a cost of self-regulation, voluntary compliance, and there is a cost of the government being eroded to the point where it can't establish a level playing field for businesses that want to compete fairly and produce safe products. So um, just to wrap up, um, I would say that um, EPA is, is not the monster that is being uh, portrayed here. Rather, it is an agency that is laboring under uh, budget shortfalls that are very severe. Um, it has fallen off on enforcement. We can find a small meeting of the minds there. I do believe that much more attention should be paid to enforcing existing laws. Um, a lot of the reason the laws are complex, though, is because industry does have an opportunity to participate and crafts very complicated requirements that um, then get held up on the floor of the house and uh, ridiculed. Um, I'm done. I saw several people smile. Let me ask the first question, then I want you to uh, uh, ask each other the questions uh, and engage in a discussion for 10, 15 to 20 minutes, if I can. And I'll, uh, I'll throw it back to Jeffrey Clark. It, when you began your uh, comments, there was a bit of a flavor of EPA has 
shifted focus from law enforcement to things that are regulatory at a high level, in, in some sense because they were easier, it was part of a grand plan. Can you explain if I've heard that correctly and, and elaborate on that? I mean, is, is it because winning in court is, is harder and regulation is easier? And, and if so, what does that say, good or bad, about what EPA should be doing? Well, I, I wish I was a fly on the wall at various conversations that, uh, that Carol Browner at the White House holds as the climates are. Uh, uh, you know, I, I have inklings as to what I might hear if I were there that would really shock me. Um, all I can do, uh, since I'm not privy to those conversations, you know, I could, I could note that, uh, that, that Ms. Browner was a member of a socialist organization, but I, but, but I could also uh, just put the evidence before you and ask you to draw an inference, right? Which is, if you're really about environmental protection, where is it that the rubber meets the road on that? Particularly since, you know, while David tried to make a case that, that CO2 is just like any conventional pollutant, it's really not true. The conventional pollutants are poisons. They cause, you know, direct death. People inhale them and they cause either lung dysfunction or they cause people to get diseases or they die. That's not what happens with CO2. It's an indirect argument as to what happens in the global atmosphere and then the effects that that will have if people don't take adaptation steps. And by the way, EPA and its regulations refuse to look at what common sense adaptations people would take. So you have to juxtapose, I think, that which, pe what, which the agency is doing in enforcement, which is you know, dramatically scaled back, plummeted in the words of the New York Times, versus what it's doing on the regulatory front, which expands government control, which appears to hurt the economy, which drives jobs off seas, uh, overseas. And then you have to ask yourself, you know, is this, is this something that is deliberate or is this all just, you know, happenstance? Uh, for an agency that wants to protect the environment, you know, it would just seem easy to make a course correction to put some of these, you know, do you have to have 50 boxes on a chart? Wouldn't, wouldn't 10 rulemakings uh, do? And then shift some of those resources into enforcement? Yet it's not happening. Professor or, or uh, well, look, I, I, If there's been a fall off of enforcement, I would never quarrel with the New York Times. Uh, that, then that's, that's, that is something, like with Rena, I deplore. Uh, it's not, uh, it's not a, uh, a very good answer for why, it's, it seems like another excuse for why we should continue to not deal with the pent up problem of global warming, which um, after all, the Bush administration gave it its best shot and couldn't convince the Supreme Court. The, um, uh, on, this, on this last point in Roger's slide, everybody's gotten very good at developing train wreck slides, which have as many boxes as you could uh, uh, on a page and look bewildering. Uh, what uh, Administrator Jackson has said is that the agency is trying to pull these things together into sectoral, multi-pollutant uh, packages that organize and uh, uh, let's say all the things that are relevant to the power sector, or all the things that are relevant to the oil refineries, into a logical uh, uh, proceeding where you can see how X relates to Y, and, and, and make rational decisions about the order in which you do things and the emphasis on which you put on, on things. Now, she also has limitations on how much freedom she has to do that, because the Clean Air Act is constructed uh, to deal with different kinds of problems and set a set of deadlines, some of which uh, allow flexibility and others don't. I think they're doing the damn best they can to create a, uh, an organized uh, uh, setting for each industry uh, in which to bring forward all the issues that relate to that industry and uh, go through a rulemaking with, with proper opportunities for comment and for real information to be put forward rather than uh, speechifying at, at sessions like this. And uh, let's, let's all work together in that process. There are uh, many instances in which NRDC sits down with companies to try to make sense of and um, uh, uh, make as, as integrated as possible the, um, uh, the working out of the, of the Clean Air Act and even the Clean Air Act and other laws. Uh, I give you, for example, after all this time, 
the example of the automobile clean car peace treaty, uh, which was worked out among the industry, the environmentalists, the states, and the federal government. We know how to, to work together to solve these problems, and, uh, and that would be a better use of all the talent in the, in, um, in the room. Um, Mr. Martello, I'd like, let me say, uh, put some of Professor Steinzor's comments into a federalist framework and see if, uh, if you'll react to them. Imagine she had said, well, look, uh, you know, we don't, we have an agency issue with a small a. The EPA is supposed to represent, in some sense, a political process that created a very expansive statute and said, go forth until we change your mandate. It, it is part of the executive branch. You might claim it's an independent agency on some days of the week, but uh, I, as a good federalist, Professor Steinzor wouldn't say that. So um, it's the strong president is, wants this to happen. The Congress hasn't stepped in using the political branches and stopped it. So why shouldn't it go forward and use every tool uh, that it has been given by a series of, uh, of fairly open-ended statutes and court decisions to, uh, to do what it believes in its expertise is the correct thing? No, I, I think it's a fair point. I think you know, what I'm hearing among all four of us is that no one said we don't think EPA should be working towards regulating a better environment. Professor talked about a better environment for our children. I have uh, my 11-year-old, my 6-year-old, and my 3-year-old in the back the back row there, and there's nothing I want more, there's nothing I cared about more at EPA when I was there. I want them to have a better environment than what I had growing up, um, and I think we can all share that. I think the question is how do you get there, and what considerations do you take into account? Right now, I think, and picking up on some of the things Jeff and David said, David said a couple of things, that EPA is taking a sectoral, multi polluting strategy in a logical and rational way. And that sounds really appealing. I think we like the idea of a sectoral, multi polluting strategy in a logical and rational way. But I think the problem is that's not what they're really doing. Um, we look at one sector, the Portland cement sector, a very important sector to our nation's infrastructure. Um, we can't have growth in the U.S. without cement. I think that's a, a common understanding. EPA is approaching that so quickly that they finalized the rule now that will undisputedly shut down probably 20% of the nation's cement kilns as soon as it goes into effect and have much longer impacts on that. But they were so quick to finalize that rule, halfway through the comment period, they admitted, oh, we've got another rule coming out that's going to change all these standards. But we're not going to wait before we finalize this rule. We're going to finalize the Portland Cement Rule, and then this other rule is going to change it, but we're not going to worry about that because we have to get these things out the door. And, and so the, 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 quite, the dispute is not, should they be regulating? I think they should. I think they, they should probably be regulating more in many ways. But they have to also, at the same time, take a breath and look at these impacts, not proceed blindly without analyzing the impacts, not proceed blindly without understanding the way all these different rules impact together, and also taking account, again, these multinational issues to the extent this, and I, I do disagree with Professor when she says she doesn't believe that this is a driver for facilities shutting down the U.S. Um, my clients believe it is. My clients want to stay in the U.S. They want to build facilities here. But when they have two years of permitting delays, and uncertainty with states that are now complaining about construction bans, like Wyoming, and then in provinces in China that are saying, come here, we'll, we'll give you dormitories for your employees, we'll give you incentives, we'll give you growth funds, um, we'll do everything we can to attract you here. And there's, while the companies have their own environmental standards, there's no, no environmental permitting to be set up. It creates an impossible position for them. So environment is playing a significant role. And can protect, I, can protecting our interest industry here long term. Can I just uh, respond to one thing? I was waiting for this to come up. I knew it would. This uh, issue of supposed construction bans. Now, this is one of the uh, 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 the bloody shirt that's being waved uh, in the uh, litigation about um, uh, the greenhouse gas rules, and it's a um, a, a frequently uh, level charge in the Congress. Well, let's let's go to the facts here. The facts are that on January 2nd, when the permit requirement kicks in, in 49 states, and I'll come to the 50th state in a minute, anyone who needs a permit will be able to get it either from the state itself or from the EPA region, and the EPA region will be filling in only until the state has its uh, local laws and regulations fully squared up. Most of the states will already have them in place by that time. There will be some places where the greenhouse gas permit will have to be issued by the EPA region. 
and none of the smaller sources will be hassled by the need to get a permit. What's the one exception? It's the Lone Star State. Texas is the only state that is refusing to implement the changes in the rules or to allow EPA to play the backup role. So there's only one state in the country where big sources won't be able to get their permits on time, and that's Texas. In Wyoming, yeah, Wyoming's complaining, but Wyoming is also uh, working with the EPA so that the, uh, any sources in Wyoming that need permits before uh, Wyoming has its own laws and, and regulations fully in order would be able to get them from the EPA in uh, Denver. And that's exactly what uh, Governor Frudenthal said uh, two days ago. So this construction ban issue, which is being uh, uh, raised in order to try to stampede the Congress into precipitous action, is a complete fraud. I need 15 seconds, because first of all, the construction ban or freeze language comes from EPA. Um, Assistant Secretary Gina McCarthy filed an affidavit in the court referring to a construction ban. Um, and and while they say it's just it Texas. The reason it won't happen, thank you, that was my second point. The question went to federalism. The reason it won't happen in many of the states, EPA is saying, if you can't comply by January 2nd, we're going to take over your state program and issue the permits for you. So when we get to the question, which begins, what is the federalism concept here? EPA's answer to that is, we're going to take over the state programs and, and impose our own permitting requirements on your states if you can't comply. So while there's a solution that would have fixed this without resorting to that uh, unprecedented action, that's how EPA is avoiding construction ban. Two things really quickly. Um, one is, I, in terms of moving offshore, I was speaking about empirical evidence. I know companies say that all the time. The second thing is, if the example is China, um, we really, for honesty's sake, need to ask if we would <coughs> ever want to live there. And sometimes my students get very discouraged about what's happening in the United States, and I always end in the last class with Google image pictures of the environment in China. And then they feel better. Can I jump in with a couple points? Uh, let's, uh, let's, let's each have uh, one more comment, and then we're going to go to questions. OK. Uh, all right, I'll, I'll just I'll jump in on this one, even though I, if I'd rather have higher priority comments. But I, I just, the, the Lone Star State, uh, as David was saying, is fighting this because it's really uh, lone among the states in sticking up for the federal's design uh, of the government and how the Clean Air Act's design is, is pushing it around as it's being abused. Uh, you know, it's not surprising that most states are going to knuckle under to this, just given the design of the act and the fact that they're taxed and then their money is taken uh, uh, to build highway funds. And if they don't basically knuckle under the EPA, then their highway funds get cut off. That's the that's the the way in which the Clean Air Act sort of clubs states into doing that which uh, they would not do if the money were left uh, uh, to them. And then the other thing is that you know David says that there's not going to be a kind of permit meltdown, but uh, and maybe his group uh, won't file lots of citizen suits to block projects, but I, I suspect that the full range of environmental community litigation groups will not take the no litigation to block permits ban, uh, 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 I'm sorry, pledge. Uh, I think you're going to see a lot of citizen suits uh, that argue that EPA didn't go far enough and try to block permits. You want to go next, Mr. Martell? Oh, um. You have a comment? All right. Uh, any, any other? Final comments from our panel, or should we go right to questions? No, let's let's yeah. get to questions. questions. Uh, please, uh, as always, keep your comments uh, relatively brief, since we do have a line. But uh, please go ahead. I am Ralph Koki, Ralph Koki from New York. Um, my question is addressed to any member of the panel. Um, my understanding is that in France, more than 90 percent of electric power comes from nuclear. It's a much lower percentage than the United States. This is a matter of uh, industry, not taking advantage of a good opportunity or the EPA protecting us from um, a nuclear disaster. And again, nuclear has no greenhouse gases. So I think that we missed a, a chunk of that, but the question was, uh, in a nutshell, should we be having more nuclear power development here, which would help uh, deal with some of these questions? Is that about right? Uh, the, question is the questions regarding greenhouse gases go away with nuclear. Is that a good or a bad option? Can the EPA help? I could take a quick stab at this. N NRDC's view on uh, nuclear is that uh, it, it needs to be, uh, you need to have uh, 
high and appropriate safety standards, most of which actually are outside EPA's purview, uh, and then it should compete for um, uh, its place in the energy mix based on its, 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 its uh, economics. The economics of uh, nuclear would be better if we were controlling greenhouse gases, if there was basically a price on carbon emissions, and nuclear would be advantaged. The reason nuclear is, is such a high proportion of the mix in France is it's, it's heavily subsidized. And there are advocates in this country and there are provisions in law to heavily subsidize nuclear here, although not to the extent that it's done in France. So th those are the factors. And NRDC doesn't have any kind of blanket opposition to nuclear energy as an electricity source um, uh, within those considerations. I'd, I'd like to say, I, I, you know, David and I can find common ground in not wanting to subsidize uh, uh, industries. Uh, I'm not sure whether that's an across-the-board position for, for, for David. For me, it's pretty close to an across-the-board uh, position. But uh, the problem is, and the reason why we don't have more nuclear in America, is not because, I think, of, of you know, an inability to subsidize it or that's not happened. It's because any plant that you would propose is going to get bogged down in environmental litigation. NEPA litigation, you know, litigation at the Nuclear Regulatory uh, 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 Commission, you're just going to have, you know, lawsuits as far as the eye can see because essentially among the environmental community there's kind of like a hysteria, an irrational reaction to nuclear. I can remember growing up as a kid, you know, seeing the China Syndrome and the whole, you know, Jane Fonda running around, th you know, I mean, France, as, you're, as you say, is doing it safely. If you really were serious about climate change and you wanted to allow an industry to solve that problem without producing greenhouse gas emissions and generating power, you would actually maybe even think about uh, potentially subsidizing it. But in reality, all the, the litigation uh, problems are what blocks the plants from going forward. If that were the reason, then the number one ask of the nuclear industry would be to shortcut NEPA or to uh, shortcut environmental laws. That's not their ask. Their ask is for money. Their, their, their ask is for money in part because they want guarantees uh, uh, that the insurance regime will work well so that you can it, it, you invest it in on a stable basis instead of <clears throat> an idea of the other side of the litigation part, right, would be, you know, tort incidents. So the tort system in America is broken as well, and that's a reason why you need a rational insurance regime. So that's why they ask for that on, on that side. They also ask for NEPA reform, believe me. I think we, we could spend a lot of time on that question, but let's uh, – let's uh, at least move on to one more, see if we can come back. Thank you. Uh, I'm Howard Klein from Orange County, California. I have really two quick questions. One, if, if uh, CO2 is a pollutant and if CO2 is the natural product of metabolic processes, then we're all, we are all, everybody in this room is a source of pollution. Therefore, I would ask what are the practical limits or the legal limits to the EPA power to control uh, every aspect of human endeavor? Number one. Number two, if, if what makes CO2 a pollutant is the fact that it, causes, so it may cause global warming, what is to prevent the EPA from next regulating water vapor, which is probably at least as powerful a, a, a generator of global warming effect? Well, maybe I could take a quick stab at those two. The, the, the answer to the first one is simple. The Clean Air Act regulates pollutants, but from defined kinds of sources, and you and I and trees, and so on, are not sources under the Clean Air Act. Cars are, power plants are, industrial facilities, fuel burning sources can be, and uh, the, the law just distinguishes between big ones and small ones. And so that's how come uh, you and I and our home furnaces are not subject to the same rules that power plants and cars might be. On the question of water vapor, um, the I think the simplest way to answer that is that water vapor, the human contribution to the water vapor burden is insignificant uh, compared to the natural contribution, uh, natural sources of water vapor. So if you're looking for what actually influences the temperature, it's the carbon dioxide emissions, it's the emissions of certain other industrial gases, the six ones which uh, uh, have been uh, covered by the endangerment determination. And then there's a straight up scientific story as to why that's so and why water vapor is not part of the problem. Next question. Yes, thank you. Greetings from Region 10. 
Uh, that would be North Idaho as a part of. Uh, question is, um, we, have, we have road districts and, and people in Idaho that are looking at uh, environmental goods as luxury goods, no longer affordable. When we have road districts that are seriously considering letting this road or that road go back to dirt uh, or gravel, um, and we have uh, a real desire to educate our kids, and with a balanced budget amendment in the state, we're required to. Now, when Governor Otter comes this year and says the rainy day fund is gone, and we can't make our contributions to the CERCLA cleanup to contribute to the 90-year rod that's currently contemplated for the upper uh, basin of the Coeur d'Alene River. <coughs> My question is from a, from a regulatory trigger. There's a regulatory trigger that's going to happen when the state of Idaho says we can't help you anymore. And I'm wondering what that regulatory trigger is. Um, and it's just a rule, but since this is a CLE, I figured it's an easy question. I'll ask it. Thank you. You're wondering what happens when the state can't meet its matching share under Superfund? Yes. Are there responsible parties who are identified? Uh, there's an Erasco settlement fund which provides a pot of gold for the initial kickoff to the proposed plan. Uh, the proposed plan purports to allow uh, responsible mining, but that's not defined. So Hecla and Coeur d'Alene Mines are a little nervous. Um, and I think, I forget if it's a 10 but the, or 20 percent kicker that the state of Idaho is supposed to be able ten. to contribute. Is it 10? Thank yeah. you. I think they would, if they shifted the site, and I'm not saying this would necessarily be easy, and obviously I don't know enough about it. I'm sure you know much more. Obviously you do. More than I want to know. Yeah. I'm they could shift it to an enforcement track um, and provide federal funding without regard to the matching share. Yeah. And, and I've actually been to Coeur d'Alene Lake a couple times, and in my view, it's one of the top two most challenging environmental sites in the country, Tar Creek and Oklahoma probably being the other. And so I have a sense of what you're experiencing there, exactly how complicated a problem was. We tried to help fix it. I, unfortunately, I wasn't able to, but it, this, is a, this is an issue that I think you have the law on the one hand. You're asking some very good questions about the law, but sometimes you have issues that go beyond the language of the law, and we, we need all the stakeholders you know, the federal government, the state government, um, Congress, uh, the state legislatures, and the companies. You have companies that are bankrupt from time to time, they go in and out, um, to really look more holistically at one of at these problems. And hopefully, beyond, you know, the letter of the law, that, that you have the, the people doing that right now. I, the most interesting legal question is, uh, when there's a McCarran Amendment watershed adjudication going on in that Basin 94, uh, and EPA wants to reroute eight or ten rivers from their banks or line the rivers uh, to protect pollutants from escaping. Uh, does the EPA have to submit its plan to the state water court, given that it's given up adjudication under the McCarran, McCarran Amendment for certain purposes? Uh, but I don't expect you guys to be able to answer that today. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. So preemption question. This Next. question is for Professor uh, Steins or but anyone I think would be interested in, in the answer to it. A few years back, uh, when the Kyoto Accord was being discussed and debated, uh, a couple environmental groups, I'm not sure whether they were the most reliable, uh, suggested that even if those accords were agreed to, that uh, they wouldn't come anywhere near dealing with the major problem. This is a apocalyptic language that we're about to face in the next 50 years. If that's the case, is the EPA in the position of uh, rearranging the proverbial chairs? Yeah, yeah, that is the a Titanic. That is a, you, you, it's a global warming question. Look, the Kyoto uh, uh, Protocol sketched out a budget for developed country emissions for a five-year period. We're right in the middle of that period right now, 2008 to 12. The legislation that was considered last year uh, would sketch out an emissions budget for the United States that would have gone out to 2050, a decline, and, and, the, and the conventional view backed by uh, the scientific, the majority of the scientific community is that to hold the level of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere to a level 
that would result in only a two degree average increase centigrade in worldwide temperatures, which is huge, that that kind of a budget uh, is necessary for the developed countries and the developed countries to reduce by about 80% their, their, their carbon dioxide emissions by 2050. And that's what we have to do if we want to avoid the catastrophic buildup of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. You need to remember that the pollution, that, that, like, that, that unlike ozone smog pollution, which is literally here today and gone tomorrow, and is replenished every day by a new batch of pollutants from our cars and so on. The global warming pollutants last in the atmosphere for 100 years or more. So they build up like uh, every year's emissions raise the level in the bathtub higher. And we're, we're, we're building a legacy for our children uh, of pollution in the atmosphere that uh, will take hundreds of years to work off, even if we were able to make those deep reductions uh, on that kind of schedule. The longer you delay, the deeper the reductions, and deeper and faster the reductions would have to be, the more disruptive the impact in the, on the economy. We're already late, and that's why we think it's important to get started on this ramp down now. Can, can, I, I, can I just? I, I just want to jump in quickly and, and say, David, what, what's the drop dead point? Let me ask you a kind of Julian Simon challenge to you, probably to some folks who understand that, that reference. Uh, what's the point, what's the date? Is it 10 years from now? If, if we have a business from uh, as usual scenario, nothing significant changes either in the US or the world. Uh, you know, we just continue to emit as we have been. At what point do we really see the catastrophe? And let's make a date to meet back here at the Federal Society Convention in that year and see whether there really is catastrophe. Well, I think we're at the point, we're talking about degrees of catastrophe. Look at, look at what's happened already. I mean, when I started working on this problem 20 years ago, I hoped that the kinds of impacts which are manifest now would not be manifest till way into the, the you know, till my children were my age. We, we're, we're headed for an ice-free Arctic. We're, we're seeing six to eight degrees change in the average temperature of the Arctic region. Now the Arctic controls our weather. It determines how cold it is here in the winter, how hot it is in the summer. And that's just one example of how everything is changing. And, and there's uh, more ice at the other pole. Let me, let me, and, uh, and that may and, and, and <laughs> shifting the ice around may not be a good idea. But look at last Sunday's New York Times. There was this, uh, there was, uh, you, know, you invoked the New York Times for authority, allow me to. They, they, they did a comprehensive survey of views on uh, sea level rise and on loss of ice. If the glacial ice on Greenland melts and flows back into the ocean, the sea level all around the world will rise on the order of 21 feet. Goodbye, Manhattan. Now, you know, you may say, I don't know whether that exclamation was of disbelief or of, or, or of shock to think that something might happen. Well, Sounds I mean, like what, is, claim. what is the, it's not an Al Gore claim. It, it's a, it, 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 what is it about this group that finds it so difficult to deal with scientific issues on the basis of rational evidence and, and looking at what the scientific experts would, uh, would tell you. Now, you may not believe that the scientific experts would tell you that because I told you, and that's your right, and that's fine, but check yourself, and you will find that we are running very large risks of huge consequences. The maps that the Times published show the impact on the Chesapeake Bay, the impact on Florida, the impact on Louisiana, the impact on New York City, the impact on Bangladesh, the impact on Indonesia, of sea level rises of three and six feet. You all have to decide whether you believe that that could happen. But if it did happen, I hope you'd agree it would be a catastrophe. The, the IPCC so let me, uh, is, is let not me. predicting anything like that, and David was filibustering a little bit, so let me just say, the reason why I think the audience is Are skeptical... Are you appealing to the IPCC for authority? I am I'm a, I'm appealing to it in the same way you were appealing to the New York Times, maybe. Uh, but look, 
Uh, the reason why I think the audience is skeptical is because it's a, it seems like it's a form of modern Malthusianism, and it doesn't have any faith in the ability of the market economy to adapt, for people to change, uh, you know, for us to respond to problems. It's like a prediction that, you know, we're going to be overtaken by a population explosion, which is what we saw in the 70s, and it didn't emerge, which is why I re, you know, up to you my debate that let's appear here 10 years from now and see if there's really... Let's uh, find higher ground. Could I, this question is on the okay, same topic, me, if I could. Let me, um, uh, just, uh, <laughs> Professor sure. Steinzor has been extremely patient, so I want to give her a, a chance to talk. Uh, I, it's okay, I want to get to your question. I, I, yeah, just, you. I do urge you to um, not try and kill the messenger, especially the non-scientific messengers. Ignore them if you want. But do go read the science, and the IPCC is a good place to start. Thank you for, for letting this question come in. Uh, the only thing we're missing on the panel is a, a polar bear should be in one of those, one of those chairs. Uh, the questions for Professor Sizemore. Before I say it, I just, I just want to make clear, I have no dog in this fight. I haven't been hired to represent anybody. I'm really just interested in good science, but it has to be unbiased science. So I am curious, when we have this conversation at lunch, about the science, are we going to be talking about the fraud that came out of the EPA agency in, uh, in Great Britain that showed that those numbers had been cooked for political reasons? That's number one. Number two, the substantial amount of literature that's available now showing suppression and censorship and retaliation against eminent scientists who came out and said they really do not agree with this and it's a phony consensus, and are we also going to be talking about the fact that it doesn't matter how many scientists believe one thing or another. Science, it's what's correct. And I realize this, this isn't exactly a legal issue, but I would certainly hope one of the things we need in a change in the political culture on the Hill is in fact a more openness to really be looking at what this science is, because I'd have to say right now, from what the reading I've done, I don't believe you, the two of you. That's, I mean, that's just, I, you may believe it, but uh, I'd have to say, uh, educated and um, objective citizen, I don't. Um, if I could respond, I agree with you that it's important for science to be correct. I would never argue that um, scientific nuances are easy to understand, but while we're on the subject of correct, what happened in Britain was at a university, East Anglia, it had nothing to do with the Environmental Protection Agency in the United States. There have been um, thorough investigations by scientists of what happened there, and there is the scientists were reprimanded for the language they used, but there was never, a, nobody has found that they distorted the science as a result. Um, I think there is a problem when we have most of the people who specialize in the relevant scientists, the vast majority, saying one thing and a relative handful saying something else. Um, so. You know, I, 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 I just I say I mean, people have this image that the, the climate skeptics or climate deniers are brave Galileos, uh, and they are the ones who see the scientific future, and we'll all um, understand later that they were being persecuted. Please, just, uh, it just go out and read the summary of the IPCC report. Go read... Go read, the sum, go read the National Academy of Sciences report that was issued last spring. These are clarion calls to the citizenry to translate the basic science into language that you and I can understand that has been, these are, these, these are the preeminent experts on this. I, I don't like to just make a call to expertise, but at some point you have to give some credit to the people who got their PhDs in these relevant disciplines and the process that they went through, which is, as it's a, you start with a peer-reviewed literature, then you have an assessment process to put that into a bigger picture, which itself is loaded with peer review, 
And then you have governmental review on top of the peer review. And no, that's all to be thrown out as some kind of conspiracy? Come on. It's, you would not go to, you would not put your medical future in the hands of these outliers if this was your cancer or your illness. You would go look for the best experts at the best universities in the best medical schools. Why not take the same approach to the, to the climate science? I think, actually, that the root of the climate skepticism is that if you acknowledge there's a problem, there needs to be a solution. It's very difficult to see what the solution is that doesn't involve government policy. So if your primary basis, primary load, uh, load star in your life is that government, sh government is bad, then you can't acknowledge the existence of problems which can only be solved with action by government. Uh, I think it's necessary to think through why uh, so many people in this room are skeptical of the science and, and, and start over with, the, with, with a look at the materials. We have only 30 seconds left, and I've been told to end on the dot, and Roger says he's got 30 seconds to say, so I am going to let him have the last word. Okay, I'll keep it less than 30. I'm not a scientist. I have my own views, and so I never opine on the science because I'm not qualified to do so. I'm just a lawyer. But I, I do want to say, if you assume what, what David and Professor are saying are true, it gets back to the notion of the policy and the regulations not syncing up with the science, because what the regulations are doing is encouraging companies to go to other parts of the world where they will emit more greenhouse gases and thus exacerbate the scientific problems we have. I know there's been some critique. Is that really true? Is that going to happen? Congress thought it was going to happen. Congress set up a whole category of energy-intensive, trade-sensitive industries where Congress, Democrats on Congress, Republicans on Congress, said these industries will move to other parts of the world unless we protect them from climate change impacts. So I think from that perspective, you know, a large number of Congress members, Democrats primarily, bought into the notion that this international carbon leakage will happen. And if we are concerned about the science of climate change, the policies we're moving forward right now are only going to make the problem worse and not better. I want to thank the, our distinguished panelists for this. This has been in, uh, in the greatest tradition.